Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. On behalf of the Environmental Defense Fund, I'm truly delighted to welcome you all to this Independent Food System Summit Dialogue on transitioning to nature positive production, sharing lessons across land and sea. It's my privilege to serve as the moderator for this important dialogue that brings together the voices of smallholder producers across land and sea. Let me give you a little context before I take you through the agenda and introduce our speakers. As you're likely aware at this point, the United Nations Secretary General will convene a food system summit in September, 2021. This summit is about working together to transform the way the world produces, consumes, and thinks about food. It's about achieving more healthy, more sustainable, more resilient, and more equitable food systems at local, national, and global levels. Food systems dialogues like this one are a key part of the lead up to this summit. And there are actually three kinds of dialogues of the food system summit dialogues, independent, convened by anyone who wishes to do so, like this one, member state, which are organized by national governments, and global, which are aligned with global events on major issues like climate and the environment, to name just two. The goal of these dialogues is to bring together a diversity of stakeholders, including voices that are seldom heard, and to provide an important opportunity for participants to debate, collaborate, and take action towards a better future. To give us a chance to connect, to meet new partners, to inspire and to be inspired. Their outcomes are formally channeled back into the summit planning process and its outcomes. In today's independent dialogue, we're going to hear from a variety of small scale producers from both land and sea about the transition to nature positive production and the challenges inherent in doing so. Protecting biodiversity Ensuring sustainability, building resilience to climate change, and fostering equity will all require bold action and sensitivity to the needs of vulnerable communities and those of the food producers themselves. Doing so successfully will require integrating our thinking across land and sea. So today, we're aiming to foster collaboration between land and sea actors that can help move the needle across the sectors and to channel their voices to food system decision makers. In the course of our discussions, we're going to spotlight similar challenges and possible solutions. We're going to share lessons learned across land and water that could each be valuable for the other. And we're going to identify areas where food system decision makers could be better supporting these small scale actors. Our dialogue is going to begin with two fire starters. First, a short presentation by Peru's Minister of Production, Jose Luis Chicoma, on how a developing nation such as Peru can take lessons from the fisheries, aquaculture, and agriculture sectors to meet food security and nutrition needs under a changing climate. We'll then hear from Olga Petriniak, Senior Director of Resilience and Food Security at Mercy Corps, on what food and nutrition security look like from a resilience standpoint, and the role of small scale fisher folk and farmers in meeting food security and nutrition needs. We'll then move to a scene setting panel discussion through which we'll explore what transitioning to nature positive production might mean for smallholders on the ground in different contexts and different sectors. A late announcement, by the way, just we learned earlier today, one of our panelists, Paul Saint-Trois, unfortunately won't be able to join us. He sent us a message that he's had a sudden health issue. We wish him well. Back to the setting the scene here. After our panel conversation, we'll break out into discussion groups for conversations and opportunities for you all to interact with the panelists. Then when we return to the plenary, We'll have a quick break for a group photo, and then we'll hear key takeaways from the discussion groups. Finally, Olga will come back to help us to wrap up with some closing remarks. In the plenary sessions, 
in case you have questions or would like to make comments, please feel free, as you've been doing already, to put them in the chat and Willow and her team or the panelists will do their best to respond. Plus, the chat will be saved. So with that, let's begin. It's my real honor and privilege to turn to the Honorable Minister Jose Luis Chicoma to ask you, Minister, to set the stage. Minister Chicoma, you have the floor. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning to you all. Uh, and thank you also, Olga Petroniak, Senior Director of Resil Resilience and Food Security of Mercy Corps. And to all the distinguished panelists in this morning. As you know, in the Ministry of Production in Peru, we are committed to building and promoting sustainable, healthy, inclusive, and fair food systems. Just before I was appointed minister here in Peru, I was advocating for policies to repair our broken food systems in Latin America for a think tank based in Mexico. It's been quite a ride to move from advocating for policies to approving and implementing policies and quite a challenge for sure. Um, and actually one of the key issues from my advocacy um, experience and from here has always been the sustainable use and relation with the oceans, especially in a country like Peru with very rich and biodiverse oceans. And in Latin America and the Caribbean in general, in, in, the, in the region, 85% of the fish that reaches homes comes from the artisanal sector, which rep represents the livelihood for more than 1.8 million people. So the question is, how can we think and promote with policies a good diet based on fish, if it's production and commercialization, even though it's very important, I'm going to explain a little bit more about this, it's still very precarious. And to address this, we, we, we are promoting many different programs and policies in Peru. We have already built in, in, in this administration several new art, artisanal fish landing sites, which is like this, the most basic infrastructure that fishers demand from the government and it's, uh, it's life-changing. I've, uh, I've, I've been in the inauguration of a couple of them and I hope by the end of this administration we'll be present at more, but it for sure changes their lives. And we have faced an enormous investment gap in many developing countries and in particular in Peru when we uh, try to, uh, of course, like to address these gaps and with many demands from resources, especially in these very difficult times for public budget budgets is quite difficult, but we're trying to accelerate the closing of this investment gap uh, in the fastest way that we, that we can. And, and this in infrastructure that we have built will benefit more than 8,000 fishers with a landing capacity of uh, several uh, hundred tons per, per day of local fishes, such as chidi, espejo. It's, it's, it's funny how all the names uh, of fishes change, change in every single country, even in Spanish uh, speaking countries in Latin America. This is the Peruvian jaque in the north of Peru and many migratory uh, species uh, such as jumbo squid and maki maki. So it's going to change um, lives for sure. Another issue that uh, is very re related with, the, with, with small scale fishing and, and artisanal fishing for sure are food markets. Food markets in Latin America and most parts of the developing world at one point in the last few decades, they got forgotten because supermarkets and modern markets were, modern food markets were coming. So we kind of ignored them, no? And we didn't invest many public or private resources in developing their infrastructure and setting like the, like the, the best uh, commercial sites that could ensure um, quality and, and, and healthy standards. 
So in this administration, we have highlighted the importance of the more than 2,600 food markets in Peru. Um, it's one of the top five priorities of, of my administration because seven out of 10 Peruvians uh, get their food from these markets and they are not present uh, in the public agenda. They are not present in the political agenda and they are not usually present in, in, in public debates. When we talk about markets, we're probably talking about supermarkets when we're talking about food. Or, or if it's in the newspapers, we're talking about capital markets or debt markets. We're, not, we're never talking about these traditional food markets. I've been to many communities in the last few months all over Peru. Every time I am there presenting like the, the new investment study that is going to ensure that in, the, in, the, in this year or in next year, we're going to build a new market there or, or we're going to make the, the current market food market more modern. Um, I see the faces in the, in, in the people that work in the market and it's also life changing. It's um, incredible that actually the, the government goes there to promote markets. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not something that is common because we usually uh, are present to, uh, to, to promote other big investments uh, that probably like are more related with with um, changes in, in the GDP and not necessarily in how inclusive our policies are, especially related directly with small producers, small agriculture producers, small fishing producers, sm 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 small scale, and also um, all, all, all the people that work in the food markets and that uh, usually are forgotten by our Policy. So we are producing these food markets, the traditional food markets of the future, especially in those places where the greatest amount of fish production is suffered. And we have approved regulations that guide the design of new establishments, the modernization of existing ones. And we are promoting all these uh, public and private investment projects at the national level on a portfolio of 30 projects um, in 12 of the 25 regions that we have in Peru. We're also organizing traveling fairs across the different regions of Peru with the goal of promoting better eating habits through the consumption of seafood thanks to our national program called in Spanish, A Comer Pescado, Eat Fish. And it's been also very interesting on, on even though Peru has one of the most um, rich and diverse um, oceans in, in the world. And we, we say that we are the birthplace of ceviche. And I, I, I hope that nobody is going to challenge me on this. And, but at the same time, our levels of per capita consumption of fish are not as high as they should be. Uh, and also something very important, in many places with a big diversity of different fishes, they, they don't, the consumption at the local level of these uh, particular fishes is not promoted by the government. We go there usually and promote uh, other fishes that are not located there and uh, not related with what they produce. So we are changing this with these traveling fairs and we are also working with um, the gastronomic sector, the restaurants and, and, and other people to to emphasize how they can um, use the local fishes uh, according to their preferences and their, and their production. Uh, and actually, this is also related not only with nutrition, but also with economic development and, and inclusion of the small scale fishers, the artisanal fishers there. In the, um, in the last six months, we have almost doubled the direct purchases that we made make for artisanal fishers on these uh, and fish farmers compared to the previous six months, uh, going from 19% to 40% of our age. We, we should buy 100% of the fishes for the trolling first from small scale and artisanal fishers. However, due to many restrictions related with uh, quality and, and health standards, we, we can't do it now. 
but we have moved from 19 to 40 percent, which is a big increase. And this should be an agenda that is a priority in the next um, in the next uh, few months or years. And it's a tool that is extremely powerful in bringing these small producers closer to markets and helping them to open doors and integrate into these value chains. If we start buying from them and we require certain standards, they're going to be able to offer their production to other markets. And this should be one of our uh, main priorities. Um, and we have also experts on fishers and agriculture deployed throughout our territory with focus on building capacity, social and productive development of our artisanal fishers and fish farmers and providing them with technical advice in the same places where they carry out their activities. One of the problems in many Latin American countries, in Peru in particular, is a centralization of everything, especially in the government based in Lima that has almost like 30% of the population, more of the concentration of the GDP here, and that reflects on many of our policies. We are trying to change that because um, the government, we can't govern from here. My goal in this very short administration is to around all of 25% of the, 25%, uh, 25 regions in Peru to bring the government to every single region that is usually forgotten by our, by, uh, centralized uh, public policies and public programs. But Thank well, you there so is- so much, Minister. Muchas gracias. I, 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 what I'm seeing is the, the advocate who's moved from advocacy to now to approving policies, but your excitement about those policies and the life-changing importance of listening and responding to those smallholders. It really comes through. I'm sorry I had to cut you off, uh, but as Willow mentioned, it really is a packed, packed agenda. And we did understand that you shortly have to leave. So having interrupted you, let me give you 30 seconds to say whatever you would like to say in conclusion. That was a very polite exit, thank you. I got I got really excited, carried out uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I actually extended the speech I had prepared like tripled. So thank you very much. Only the last paragraph that I have to say is that Peru chairs the organizing committee for the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Agriculture during the, the 2022 by the United, by the FAO. And it's also important to say that in this, very relevant independent dialogue prior to the Food System Summit organized by EDF. I emphasize Peru's commitment to approach the sustainable development goals of zero hunger, creating job opportunities, reducing inequalities and underwater life. And in particular from the Ministry of Production, we are very committed to have sustainable, healthy, fair and inclusive food systems. Thank you very much and sorry for extending uh, my participation. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Minister. That was very inspiring. And now we are going to turn to Olga. Olga Petriniak, who's going to share her perspectives on the critical role, building on what the Minister has just said, the critical role of small-scale producers in the transition to nature-positive production. Olga, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Nicola, and thank you to the Honorable Jose Luis Chicoma for, for his remarks and, and to the Environmental Defense Fund and Partners World Wildlife Fund and the Blue Food Assessment and all the panelists for holding uh, this important dialogue. It is a great honor to be here with all of you today around this incredibly critical topic of how we can strengthen nature positive production in the global food system by leveraging the capacities and the role of small scale actors. And, and I wanted to follow up on the previous remarks from a global perspective centered around resilience and food security. Today's conversation is incredibly important because despite technological innovations, global investments and a more interconnected world, 2020 marked the sixth year in a row where global hunger and undernutrition were on the rise. We are in an unprecedented moment where converging crises, including climate change, in many places conflict, and economic downturns mean that nearly 690 million people faced chronic or acute hunger in 2019, nearly 9% of the global population. 
and another 83 million are predicted to have gone hungry last year because of the global economic slowdowns caused by COVID-19. Small scale producers and entrepreneurs, so farmers, aquaculturalists, fishers that the minister talked about, are among those most affected by this reality. At the same time, we know they are at the heart of the solution and hold some of the greatest potential for reversing downward trends in food security. For example, small scale and family farms account for 75% of the world's agricultural land and nearly 570 million producers in the food system. Addressing their challenges to better navigate today's and tomorrow's crises is at the heart of achieving healthy and sustainable diets for all. And this includes enhancing their ability to ensure nature positive production in an era of global and local disruptions. So my organization Mercy Corps works in some of the world's most fragile places and our global teams witness daily how the converging crises of climate, conflict and COVID undermine the livelihoods and food security of small scale actors. In real terms, it means a single drought in Ethiopia can throw a family into severe debt, forcing them into more extractive and unsustainable land management practices so they can pay, make payments or else risk losing their few assets. It means that fear of displacement from one's own land due to a natural disaster or a conflict in the DRC prevents a family from investing in nature positive farming practices practices that may have higher costs today, but much greater benefits in the future. And it means more young people in farming families being pulled out of school, turning to low skill wage labor so their families can eat, thus limiting the potential of young people to invest for nature positive innovations in the food system. But at Mercy Corps, we also witness a world of possibility and the incredible resilience of small scale actors turning crisis into opportunity. Across the globe, we partner with smallholder producers to support them on their journey from fragility to resilience. This means supporting more inclusive and equitable governance of land and water resources. It means building linkages to markets and financial service options that promote resilience, such as those that the minister just talked about. It means leveraging technology for more equitable investments and building bridges across social divides. So just a couple of examples in the DRC through Mercy Corps facilitated dialogue platforms and extension services, landowners, sharecroppers and local leaders strengthened land management agreements and ultimately redesigned land use across water catchments to combat erosion, increase soil health, capture and retain water and ultimately increase land productivity. In Nepal, partnership with farming communities and the private sector has increased the production of sugarcane along river banks prone to erosion and flooding. Thousands of hectares of agricultural land have been protected while providing communities with a high value market-based crop and direct linkages to processors. In Kenya, through partnership with a wide network of digital market platforms, Smallholder farmers growing food for millions of Kenyans are able to access a wide range of knowledge and market support services. These digital partners provide information solutions on climate resilience inputs, extension advice, links to storage and aggregation options, as well as links to financing. So throughout this dialogue, we will hear many more stories of resilience from small scale actors working to achieve nature positive production amidst threats and disruptions to support a more prosperous and more food secure future. It is lessons from their experiences and the experiences of others like them that will ultimately help ensure better outcomes for people and planet. And I look forward to listening, learning with all of you and ensuring their voices shape the critical commitments as we look ahead to the UN Food System Summit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olga. That framing was so important because what's striking is the you, you really emphasize the urgency and you also shared that perspective from the ground where you're seeing the most vulnerable and often the most resilient people and the solutions that they're coming up with and you're supporting it. So thanks very much. And thank you for fanning the flames of our discussion fires, which thanks to you and Minister Chacoma, they're well on the way. 
So Olga, we're looking forward very much to be hearing back from you later on when you'll be sharing some reflections on what we've, on what we've been hearing at the close, excuse me, of this dialogue. And now we're going to shift gears. We're going to hear directly from our panelists who are smallholders. Once again, a reminder to please mute if you're not speaking. Um, our smallholders who are farmers, who are fishers, who are mariculturists. We're going to learn more about what nature positive production might mean on the ground in different sectors and in different contexts. So a definition, the Food Systems Summit organizers have defined nature positive production as any production practices that protect, manage and restore nature while globally meeting the fundamental human right to healthy and nutritious food for all. If you think that sounds broad, it, it is, it's, it's broad by design and it can include many different food production techniques. So let's now hear from our panelists on this. And you've got, you can see the panelists on the screen. And um, let me just mention that, uh, well, since you've see, you see them on your screen, we've got Bren Smith, who's executive director of Green Wave and who's a regenerative ocean farmer in the US, in the Northeast United States. We have Dr. Mala Reddy, who's director of Acción Fraterna Ecology Center and is working with small farmers to promote natural farming in the semi-arid district of Anantapur in South India. We have Lonco Ariel Enriquez, who is Lonco or chief of the Wafawapi community. He's a social leader, artisanal fisherman, shellfish diver, and human rights defender from Guafo in Chile. We have Henry Preciado Chune, who's technical manager of the Mangrove Consortium uh, in Tumbes, Peru, and coordinator for the World Bank supported Peruvian National Fishing and Aquaculture Innovation Program. And we have a duo, Pak Mismon Small Scale Fisher and Pa Ayu Listiani Putri, who's an enumerator. They're both in the blue swimming crab fishery in Lampung, Indonesia where members are working to improve sustainability and resilience. And finally, we have Jibo Banya, who's a small scale farmer. He's chief of the village of Namaripel in Niger. He's chairman of the board of directors of the Peasant Platform of Niger. And he's the former president of the West African Network of Peasant Farmer Organizations known in French as ROPA. And now, without further ado, let me turn to our first panelist, Bren Smith. Bren, you've spent the first part of your life working as a commercial fisherman before making a rather drastic but successful transition to seaweed farming. Now, in addition to running your own farm, you've been looking to spread your model of regenerative seaweed aquaculture throughout the world because you believe it could help tackle climate change and food and nutrition insecurity. So the question for you is, why did you make that switch? And how did capturing wild fish, then harvesting a cultivated crop, change your perspective on food production? In other words, what are some things you think farmers and fishers can learn from each other? And, oh, by the way, you have four minutes and I am going to start <laughs> the stopwatch. Over Absolutely, thanks so much. Total honor to be here and I'll, I'll keep it short because I'm excited for the, the discussion. I was born in, uh, and I can only speak from a North American uh, context, I was born in Newfoundland, Canada, high school dropout, headed out to sea, and I fished the globe when it was, you know, the, at the height of industrialized fishing, I was a pillager. And then the cod stocks crashed back at home, 30,000 people thrown out of work, um, amazing to see an economy gutted overnight because of ecological collapse, and that's where began to realize like I'd been listening to environmentalists and they had it wrong. They were telling me this was about birds and bees and bears and conservation zones and MPAs. And it's not like climate change, protection of the, uh, of the oceans is a kitchen table issue. It's a question of how do I die in my boat one day, happy and fulfilled? How do I make a living on a living planet? So that was a major shift that I think has carried over into the climate economy. And it's really, how do we build a climate economy with agency, with jobs, with meaning, protecting our culture as fishermen and farming? Like I would say, there are no, no songs about 
lawyers, but there are lots of songs about farmers and fishermen. And there's a reason for that. And we, we want those soul, soul filling jobs. Next thing I'd say is, so, you know, I was reborn as a aquaculturist, as a fish farmer. And my big mistake there was growing around existing markets, right? Still not asking the ocean, what does it make sense to grow? We said grew salmon and tuna because people ate salmon and tuna and we polluted the environment and um, just grew around existing wild palates instead of understanding that the earth is gonna dictate our flavors. The ocean is gonna dictate our flavors. Our business partners are the ocean now. We have very little control of that and markets need to bend to the will of the planet. So where I ended up, and when you ask the ocean what to grow, it says, why don't you grow things you don't have to feed and you don't swim away? And that's how I ended up a shellfish and seaweed farmer, which has the power of zero inputs. So no fresh water, no fertilizer, no feed. It's regenerative capturing carbon and nitrogen rebuilding roofs. I mean, um, uh, reefs and, ha and allowing me to not have a boss, have a self-directed life and retain that culture and be a, be a happy, happy person as opposed to be stuck in the cubicle class. So um, that's sort of, that's how I got here. I want just quickly, if I got a one or two minutes, talk about the collaboration between land and sea, because it's a really potent set of work at Greenway, my organization. It's like this opportunity to break down the seawalls and share nutrients, for example. There's a nutrient crisis on land. Well, we have them in the ocean. So let's collect them with our kelp, for example, move them to the soil so that farmers, land-based farmers have another tool for delicious, uh, healthy vegetables. And when you do that, one of our projects finds that um, nitrous oxide gets stabilized in the soil when you use seaweed kelp as a fertilizer. Nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon. Right? So we can actually use our kelp, capture micronutrients, all these things, get the carbon in the soil, capture that NO2, it's like that. So a huge opportunity to create a virtuous loop. Share infrastructure is another. We, COVID, we had to shut down our processing plants. We moved to abandon tobacco farms, which drove down processing costs. Share flavors. Some of the plant-based burgers we have now are kelp and mushroom, right? Why is seafood over here and land-based food? It's just never really understood this. There was an opportunity to bring it together. Share farmers, when it, like, like people have always done, like in my village, farm, you know, farm one season and fish in the winter while well, we can farm kale in, in the, um, when it's warm and farm kelp when it's, um, when it's in the winter. And then I think share politics, right? We need to defend our land, defend our leases, weave social justice into the DNA of this new climate economy. Um, uh, and I think we're, we're the ones, we have the legitimacy in society in order to articulate that new vision of justice and really do food right. So at Greenwave, we you were training, you know, 10,000 new ocean farmers in the next 10 years, got a waiting list of 8,000 people. It's absolutely daunting, but I think it really shows the potential for us as the um, ocean as a space for climate solutions. So thanks so much. Total honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Bren. What an amazing question. How do I make a living on a living planet? And your answer, ask the ocean what to grow. That's really powerful. Very inspiring. Let's go to Mala. Mala, you have been working with small scale farmers for years in southern India to implement zero budget natural farming, which operates on the principle that farming can be chemical free, low cost, regenerative and climate resilient, all while still meeting the needs of farmers and those who eat their crops. Please tell us about how this works and how it has helped to solve the challenges faced by the communities with which you work, of course, within four minutes. Thank you, over to you. You're muted, Mala. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Yes, as you said, we work in a semi-arid uh, uh, region uh, and also a paradigm called zero budget natural farming. In fact, it is actually nature enriching rather than nature extracting. So it actually follows the, the uh, very important principles from this. Actually. The forest is uh, natural, evergreen and productive and always sustainable. So this is the characteristic farming system called uh, zero budget natural farming. 
the important principles that we borrow from the uh, forest here into the farming system is uh, agro biodiversity which is uh, incorporating polo cropping uh, integrating the seasonal and uh, perennial crops into a cropping system as many crops as possible in one form and uh, following kind of a symbiosis where uh, you know a variety of crops grow exist without uh, competition for sunlight or uh, uh, roots uh, and then uh, and another important principle that we follow in this is uh, what is known as antibiosis in the sense that um, we follow biological control of pests and diseases you know like in a forest where there is no uh, any pesticide or whatever so and then the recycling which uh, recycling of the farm waste particularly uh, which enriches the soil organic carbon uh, uh, in the form and then uh, application of an inoculant uh, you know which is uh, really uh, made of the cow urine and cow dung which enriches the soil biotic life uh, in the in the form and then uh, actually the uh, another important principle uh, that we follow from forest is uh, prevent exposure of the soil uh, from direct sunlight and direct rain and wind you know that actually protects that means keep the uh, form all the time green that is the important we call it 365 days green cover so our focus is very much on small and marginal farmers that to rain fed farmers in a very very low rainfall area so is uh, working for them much better compared to the green revolution model which is very very conventional in uh, uh, india actually which is uh, this jb uh, nf is labor intensive low cost and inputs are all generated mostly from the uh, you know farm on farm itself and also uh, from the cows or any type of animals like buffaloes it is uh, in contrast to the green revolution model which is uh, which we which i call high external input destructive uh, agriculture this is the uh, you know major paradigm in in india so that is what is followed which is, this is in contrast to that actually so yeah yeah the whole uh, you know is, is the time where the whole world is moving towards uh, farming without farmers so what is happening is the world is moving to an industrial culture, uh, agriculture and then farmers are uh, more and more disappearing the first ones to disappear are small and marginal farmers so i think this kind of a paradigm is uh, more friendly to small and marginal farmers but still i think we will have to fight with the uh, you know ad uh, advent of uh, industrial farming so thank you very much and this is what i would like to say in a given time thank you so much mala and credit goes to you for uh, coming in within time so interesting to hear about borrowing principles from the forest and also moving away from this idea of farming without farmers there is no farming without farmers let's now turn to lonko ariel when it comes to fisheries management transitioning to nature positive production maybe less about what we put into the system and more about how much of which species we're taking out yet putting the needs of the producers and their local communities at the center is still critical to success so could you please tell us about the work in your community to increase sustainability sorry that was my timer you see how well mala did uh, to increase sustainability and how doing so is an opportunity to promote access to healthy and nutritious food for all. Over to you, Lonco Ariad. Four minutes, please. Good morning. I want to thank you for this opportunity. With respect to the question you're asking, it agrees with our lifestyle with what I have heard from the other panelists in their interventions. As a traditional town, since we've been working with traditional fishing activity, the artisanal fishing, which is the activity we carry out here, we have always acted with a high level of respect towards nature because we know that nature is what provides us with all type of resources and livelihoods in order to feed our families. In Chile, we have a law that is law 2249, which creates coastal marine spaces of indigenous people that are extension of territories. We call territories the overall set, that is air, sea and earth. For us, 
these are territories. In those spaces, the state guarantees management to indigenous people where they can carry out their extractive activities based on the needs required in our economies. That is how, within our active activities of artisanal fishing, we can have inside these spaces management areas, repopulation areas of different resources that we have for food, uh, and uh, based on, on those working tools and biological closures, which are a legal standard in our country, they become the formula, the important formula in order to take care of our livelihood. We can guarantee our nutritional needs in this case for our community and for other communities in times because we extract the amount we need under a defined commercial size. Nevertheless, there is something that goes beyond the line which is the awareness that exists to take care of the few things left in the world in terms of resources, because these resources have been threatened mainly by us who are artisanal fishers that work with very basic fishing gears. Industrial fishing has increasingly displaced us from our territory. Hence, for us, it is very important to set forth public policies that could help us in that aspect. But I can tell you from our own standpoint, we are capable of guaranteeing that sustainability of resources, given that based on our Cosmo vision, on our culture, we only extract uh, or fish what we need for our living and to feed our family. This is our outlook of traditional artisanal fishing, and we must guarantee that our livelihood is going to remain in time to leave resources to the coming generations. And uh, in this transition, through uh, this form, we can have uh, the resources uh, in time. One of the important territories that, that we have, which is very relevant, not only because of the economic aspect, but because of a spiritual relationship that we have, uh, that is the Waffle Island. Therefore, it is very important for us to take good care of that space. Thank you very much. Uh, that was that was really terrific, and um, I think your war your warning to make sure to pay attention to the, the need for policies when it comes to industrial fishing and just to respect nature. This is really important. And we're already hearing some commonalities emerging, in fact. But let's, let's now turn to Henry. Henry, mariculture in Peru, as we heard, plays such an increasingly important part in the economy. It's providing signature seafood to the Peruvian people, we heard who are consuming over 20 kilos per capita each year. Could you please speak to how innovation and technology have helped you to improve your mariculture operations so that they're sustainable in terms of food production, the environment and the economy? Over to you, Henry, thanks. Hola amigos, como están? Muy buenos días. Soy Henry Preciado. Good morning, my friends. My name is Henry Preciado. I am part of a group that has been supporting an organization known as the Mangrove Consortium of Northeastern Peru. This is an organization made up of six associations of fishermen of resources, such as crabs, conch, and fish in the northern area of Peru. I would like to share with you the story behind this. Since 2015, two of these six associations sought to get the management of a state-protected natural area, an area managed by CERNAN, the Service of Marine Protected Areas, and we were asked for advice. This is how we engaged in this endeavor 
coaching uh, these associations, supporting them in the technical area. And then the technical proposal was presented so that six associations will organize and will jointly request the Peruvian government the management of this marine protected area. Hence, in 2018, we started this process related to the direct management of this area by the users that exploit resources of this marine protected area. This is an innovative topic, given that marine protected areas in one way or another contribute to the development of adjacent areas with this type of management. Several objectives have been met to comply with this managerial task. First, a master plan has been designed. It has a five-year scope. In the implementation of this task, we counted on specific objectives related to the management of hydrobiological resources. There are two iconic resources in the region, black conch and crabs, in addition to other types of resources. Nevertheless, thanks to the support of the Peruvian government through the Ministry of Production, which manages a program known as the National Innovation Program, we have been able to innovate in fishing and aquaculture technology. In order to recover and manage hydrobiological resources such as conch and crab, this program has enabled us to enter in, into strategic alliances, which the consortium by itself would not have had been able to develop in the area of innovation regarding these two mentioned resources, mainly the use of biotechnology for the recovery of these hydrobiological resources. We're now working with a company that develops or is a leader in the region of aquaculture activity. Its name is Marina Sol. This company has been supporting us with the production of black conch seeds in order to take them to a treatment within the mangrove system in order to adapt, fatten, and plant them in the natural habitat. The academia has worked hand in hand with us in this task. However, we also have a partner, which is a group of young professional scientists in this area of Tumbe. The name of the company is Inca Biotech. We have been able to develop technologies for the recovery of these resources. So the organizations have developed within this marine protected area a space where the extraction of hydrobiological resources is not allowed so that this becomes a natural bank and the seed therein incorporated can produce its natural descendants and can irradiate the entire ecosystem of this sanctuary, the production of seed and of this hydrobiological resource. We have done the same thing with crabs. Right now, we are starting to develop or produce crabs at the laboratory, and the larvae or the juveniles of these resources are taken to the marine protected area to conduct releases and to allow the repopulation or the recovery of these resources. The alliances that we have created during this period have enabled us to meet the objective that we have set for ourselves. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Henry, for sharing this great example of successful collaboration with government scientists and other stakeholders. Thank you so much. We're going to shift gears a little bit now. We've been hearing about some of the opportunities. Now we're going to shift to some of the challenges. We know that small scale producers face many kinds of, of challenges, significant cha challenges in general and in transitioning to more sustainable, resilient and equitable food production practices. So now we're going to ask our next set of panelists to help us to better understand some of those challenges and what can be done to address them. So we're going to turn first to our, um, our colleagues from Indonesia, Pak Miswan and Ba Ayu Listiani. I'm going to ask uh, Pak Miswan first of all, and then uh, Ayu Listiani, um, if, uh, if I need to, I will um, stop Pak Miswan, but otherwise we can go directly into your intervention. Um, about the work that you're doing in the blue swimming crab fishery, the, the work that each of you is doing. Your community has been working to improve the sustainability of this fishery and to increase community participation in management. More recently, you've been eliminating waste, increasing product quality, 
and identifying byproduct uses of crab shells from processing. Could you first, Pak Miswan, you'll have four minutes to tell us why your community is seeking to diversify in this way and about some of the critical challenges you've encountered along the way. And then we'll turn to uh, Ma Ayu Listiani for the same question. And you have four minutes. Please go ahead, Pak, Pak Miswan. Thank you. My name is Miss Wan. I'm a fisherman from Lampung, Indonesia. My question, I mean, my answer to that question is that we have a lot of shell waste and just thrown away with no dedicated disposal in our premises and the potential for the market like in the big markets that we can target because there is a possibility that the market could be used at the local level namely used for mixed fish feed flour. The knowledge for managing production costs, marketing tools, and testing the product quality is currently something that the fisherman group The fisherman group has sought to hope that there will be an increase in the blue swimming crab sector so that the potential use of the crab shell raw material can be sustainable and done in responsible way. So please continue to explain, Bayu. Hello, good morning. My name is Ayu Listiani from Lampung, Indonesia. In my opinion, there is a lot of raw material available that is blue swimming crab shells from the crabs caught by fishermen, especially the adult crabs and the one that do not lay eggs. Their shells are just thrown away and there is no spatial disposal, both for the shell and also the water used to boil it. For the challenges is to ensure the availability of raw materials, but we we'll still need to pay attention on the sustainable aspects that have been built by the small blue swimming crab shell group. That is all and thank you. Well, Prima Kasi, uh, uh, Pak Piswan, and Bayu Listiani, we may come back to you. In fact, we're going to be coming back to you very shortly as you've listened to the others. So please do be thinking about anything that you've been, um, that you've already heard from the panelists, anything that has struck you, and we will come back to you. But it's a terrific example of recycling a waste product. Thank you so much. We're going to now hear from our final panelist, Jibo Banya. Jibo, you have been working for decades to help spread sustainable farming practices, such as agroforestry, throughout West Africa. Some countries, such as your home country of Niger or Mali, have seen widespread adoption of these nature-positive farming reforms. But throughout this region, the success of these efforts is threatened by ongoing unrest and insecurity. What conditions have enabled some communities to implement these practices sustainably and successfully? And what conditions, in your opinion, have held other communities back? Over to you, Jibo. Oh, merci, uh, 
Before speaking what we have done, I would like to put you in context. We have to admit that we are in Sahel and Le Sahel faces huge challenges, political challenges. Uh, these political challenges, challenges do not reflect what we are. We face the challenge of climate change. Every two years we have droughts uh, and if we do not face droughts, we face floods. Another challenge is that uh, of illiteracy. Sadly enough, in Africa, we have, have high levels of illiteracy. Even if we develop policies and documents, they are in languages difficult to understand, whether it is in English or in French, which are not our languages. One has difficulties adopting those policies or participating in the development or drafting of those policies. It is because of this that we have gathered in a producer's organization at the level of the village, at the level of communities, at the level of the regions and at the national level. That is the reason why we have established the platform. Given that I only have four minutes, it is going to be extremely difficult to share everything. But I want to say is that we have been able to do something. Given that we have realized that our agricultural activities that we carry out are destroying nature because we're not conducting them in an organized and intelligent manner and we do not do it with the participation of all the stakeholders. So what we have tried to do is to watch uh, through the observatory of family exploitations. And we realize that we have to focus on different activities, whether it is agriculture or fishing. Because if we only focus on one activity, if the weather is not favorable for the activity you have chosen, you can lose everything. Through these activities, we have realized that important issues must be tackled. The financial aspect must be fixed. The market aspect is very important. It needs to be fixed. The aspect of public policy must be fixed. And now what type of agriculture must be followed? We have opted for agroecology, which allows us not only to regulate the use of natural resources, which in addition to this allows us to make producers or the communities that responsible for their work. For example, we have a river that crosses our region in 150 kilometers, but fishermen cannot make a living out of that river given there is nothing there but plastic. So we have to look uh, for alternatives because uh, a, the fishing activity is not possible in that river. So we have uh, to work on fish farming and on agricultural activities, improve irrigation to comply with both of our targets uh, because it is impossible to live out of that river. To summarize, I have to remind you that if we want sustainability, we have to resort to models such as agroecology that allows us to produce under sustainable practices in order to protect our natural resources. We require financing to assist the small producers which food security has been affected by the pandemic and by many, many, many factors that do not allow them to make a dignifying living with their activities. So what, do we, what we need to do now is to use all the experiences we have heard here, document them, capitalize them and share them among us, whether it is in Peru, in Nigeria, what is important is for the group of communities to get together to share their experiences in order to make proper de decisions. Well, these are the comments I wanted to share with you. I must wrap up because time is very limited. Thank you very much. Thibault, merci beaucoup. That was really powerful, a really powerful evocation of the realities that farmers in the Sahel are facing. 
the political climate illiteracy issues, the risks of not doing the right thing, meaning losing everything, and uh, the the need that people have felt to shift to agri uh, aquaculture. But there was another word that you said that I think is really, really important, and that is dignity, ensuring that people are able to do what they do with dignity. Thank you to all our panelists. We're doing um, a great job of catching up on uh, some lost time here. Um, but it's so important. You've been listening to each other. And so we'd like to hear from you. Unfortunately, because we have to catch up on time, this is going to be a truly quick lightning round. Could you please each, I'm going to call on you in the same order as I did when, uh, when we started, share one word. A, something that has struck you, anything that has struck you in listening to each other. Ren, go. Uh, hyphens, late to the party on nature-based solutions. That's hyphens. what I feel like. That was 10 <laughs> words, sorry. Mala. <laughs> You're muted. I think the smallholders all, all over the world are struggling to compete with the uh, big, uh, big, big actors, big players. Yeah, Lonco Ariel. Over to you. The floor is yours. I will come back to you. How's that? Um, and I'll turn now to Pak Miswan. What has struck you? Pak Miswan, in listening to your fellow panelists. For me personally, it is the response from one of the panelists about aquaculture. Mr. I forgot his name, but the point is that seaweed aquaculture is very inspiring for me. But in our place, what fishermen like us need is that we wish if there were people who can support us to cultivate crabs that can lay eggs in captivity. Maybe that's what our group hopes for the future. So maybe that's for the future. Thank you. For me, I'm inspired by the use of blue shimming crab waste shells so that they can be produced even better, more useful and can be more productive for the community in particular. And we should continue the establishment of fishermen groups that have been ongoing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bayou. Um, Lonko Ariel, let me come back to you. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Now I can hear you well. The truth is that the alignment of, well, I don't know if I should call it need, but yes, it has a direct relationship everywhere in the world where our friends that are connected with us come from, with the way in which uh, we can progress in the care for nature as well as in the care for resources in order for us to maintain in time the sustainability of our resources. It is very difficult nowadays given issues such as climate change. This has been teaching us. It has been testing us to overcome all these difficulties. Even today, we are going through very difficult times. We are going to, through something terrible, critical at the level of mankind because of COVID-19. 
Hence, uh, many communities have been seriously affected from every point of view, that is, from the economic, social, spiritual, family standpoint. So we have to continue striving. And uh, as I have previously said, we, the most vulnerable communities, such as indigenous people, have experienced constant resistance. We are people who have lived uh, a defending uh, nature. We are warriors. Uh, we look uh, after what we have because uh, it is necessary to protect um, what is there. Wrap it up to turn over to our last panelist now. Thank you so much, Aria. You got a lot more than one word in there. Uh, and so, and we'll be shortly be going into the breakout rooms, but let me give the last word on this to Jibo. What has struck you in listening to your fe fellow panelists? Please go. Okay, I realized that small producers encounter many difficulties around the world. And I also realize that authorities are increasingly playing a more important role when we hear what was expressed by the minister that actors must get involved, public policies are required, others must be listened to. Activities today must focus on the problems of climate change. People carry out activities without protecting nature, whether it is the sea or the soil. Therefore, strategies are required to deal with all this together. I have felt that everywhere communities are, are striving to organize themselves and that uh, in spite of everything, people are giving ideas to the authorities and that people, in spite of everything, are working on facing all these difficulties. I will say that I'm not alone in this struggle. We are together in this. Uh, the more we work together, the stronger we become so we can be listened to. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, Jibo. And I am so sorry, Henry. When I skipped around, I skipped you. So, Henry, you have the last word. Please make it a word. Ah, genial. Yes, I think it is the construction of a fishing governance in the territory with territorial approach. Fabulous. Thank you so much. These, uh, these reactions position us perfectly for the breakout sessions. So as Willow was explaining you to, so first, thank you to all of our great panelists. You did a wonderful job and you've really helped us to set the stage.